Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for attending today's updates on COVID-19. It's uh, really great to be here. Um, as you heard, my name is Dr. Eric Chow. I'm the Chief of Communicable Disease Epidemiology and Immunizations here at Public Health Seattle, King County. And since it's maybe one of the first opportunities I get to meet many of you, I'd like to provide a little background on myself. Um, I actually joined the department in the middle of 2022, and it's been a real privilege to work here with this really incredible team. And in my role, I've been able to incorporate my background as a subspecialist in internal medicine, pediatrics, and infectious disease, as well as my previous experiences working locally as a physician, as well as an epidemiologist at the CDC. Now, uh, Dr. Duchin and I work very closely together, and of course, he continues in his role as health officer for King County, and we're incredibly fortunate to have him and to have had him uh, provide many of the COVID-19 updates that you may have attended previously. And you'll likely see us share opportunities to provide updates on COVID-19, as well as other communicable diseases moving forward. Now, my work here at Public Health is to oversee the operations of the communicable disease and immunizations teams, and our work in turn helps inform the strategic guidance for a number of different infections in the community, including COVID-19. Now, in today's briefing, I'd like to cover a few topics on COVID-19 that I know uh, many of you have been thinking about, um, and uh, including where we're currently at in the COVID-19 pandemic with some epi updates, uh, COVID-19 vaccinations and the ongoing important role that they play in our response, impacts we anticipate as a result of the expiration of the federal COVID-19 emergency declaration, as well as general considerations, including lessons learned on how we can continue to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe as our community adapts to living with the virus. So first off, I think it's actually really important to acknowledge that it's really been an undulating journey as we work together to get to this point in the COVID-19 pandemic. And through it all, we've mapped out um, a path that was aimed at keeping our community safe, using the vast amounts of knowledge that we learned about COVID-19 along the way to educate, provide guidance, uh, and address disparities that would help reduce the severity of disease, particularly among those at greatest risk. And thank you to the community leaders, media partners, healthcare assistants, individuals, and many more who provided ongoing help in broadening the reach of our public health messaging. Now, um, I wanna take a quick step back to late 2022. And as you recall in December, we raised the concern about multiple respiratory viral infections that were causing a tremendous amount of illness in our communities. This included RSV, influenza, COVID-19. At the time, uh, our healthcare systems had been working really hard around the clock to ensure that they were able to provide the help and care that was needed for all the patients that were showing up in clinics and hospitals due to these infections. And it was critical at the time that we took steps as a community to lessen the stress on our healthcare systems. Now, the combination of steps to mitigate infection through vaccination, wearing masks, isolating when ill, and improving ventilation over the holidays played a critical role in where we are now with COVID-19 and other respiratory viruses. Now, I can say that uh, since the beginning of January, uh, we have seen a decrease in the reports of RSV and influenza cases, which has certainly helped with the stress on our healthcare systems. Now for COVID-19, as you're all well aware, we track different metrics that are reported to us, including COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and death. As we already know, COVID-19 cases may be increasingly undercounted due to the increasing use of at-home antigen tests that often don't get reported to public health. And additionally, some people simply no longer choose to get tested, even if they are symptomatic. Now, uh, I find myself increasingly turning to COVID-19 hospitalizations and death data for disease burden because people with severe disease are likely to seek out medical care where they're also likely to get tested. Now, understanding that hospitalization and death have sometimes delayed reporting relative to cases, so that's something we have to keep in mind. Now, as such, we look at the overall data metrics inclusive of COVID-19 hospitalizations and death because, of course, the latter two metrics also help us track cases of severe disease. Now, since the beginning of the year, we fortunately did not see the surges of severe disease that we were concerned about, likely because we have protection from community immunity and also the layered precautions people took and continue to take. So since the new year, locally, COVID-19 hospitalizations and death have been uh, slowly dropping since December and are lower when compared to previous winter peaks. And as such, COVID-19 is much less of a stressor in our fragile healthcare system. We're also currently at a low for CDC's community level measure based on the number of reported COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations due to COVID-19, and the percentage of inpatient hospital beds occupied by patients with COVID-19, while community transmission measure is at a substantial level when measuring the new cases per 100,000 persons in the last seven days and the percent positive of PCR tests in the last seven days. 
Now, while we're in a much different place at this point in the COVID-19 pandemic, where most people are not experiencing severe disease, severe disease still occurs uh, even locally here in King County, as well as nationally. Now, for example, over the last uh, past week here in King County, someone was hospitalized for COVID-19 every three hours, and there were about 51 deaths from COVID-19 over the past 28 days. The CDC reports the national death count to be around 2,200 people a week, and that's still a substantial number. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that congregate settings such as long-term care facilities and homeless shelter sites face outbreaks where people are vulnerable to severe disease. And then among the majority of hospitalizations and deaths due to COVID-19 locally, these are among our community members who are age 65 years and older. I think these facts collectively underscore that, particularly among those with risk factors for severe disease, including older age, people who are immunocompromised, or have a weakened immune system and other underlying medical conditions, the pandemic continues to pose a substantial threat to them. Now, when most people talk about COVID-19, they're frequently thinking about acute infection, the time, uh, the time period when the virus first infects an individual and causes illness. And when we refer to severe disease, we're mostly talking about this time period during the illness course. The reality is, is that our efforts to ensure that people take layered approaches to protect themselves, we're also talking about protection against a broader range of complications related to COVID-19. And the steps that we take to reduce risk is not just for acute infection, but the risk of longer term outcomes, such as long COVID or post COVID-19 conditions, which in my opinion, we really don't talk about enough, especially given how many people experience them. So I'd like to spend a few moments to provide some information and context. Now, what COVID-19 has taught us, and increasingly more studies are confirming, is, is that health consequences of the infection, both physical and mental, can extend into the period, sometimes weeks to months after recovery, when most people expect to get back to their baseline. Now, this is true regardless of age and regardless of severity of acute infection. And in fact, long COVID or post-COVID-19 conditions have been reported in people with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic infections. Now, these conditions can include persistent or new symptoms, such as persistent fatigue or heart palpitations, which are incredibly debilitating to individuals and have an impact on their quality of life, or the development of new health conditions, such as heart attacks and stroke in the weeks to months after recovery from infection. And in fact, the New York Times actually covered um, in a recent article, the GI or gastrointestinal effects of people uh, that people experience after having acute infection. So it's interesting, Rhea, I encourage you all to take a look at that. Um, earlier last year, the CDC published two MMWR reports on these conditions. Uh, they found that adult, among adults aged 18 to 64 years, post-COVID-19 conditions could occur as frequently as one in five COVID-19 survivors and one in four among those aged 65 years and older. And since that time, a number of studies have shown that the risk of heart attacks, stroke, and blood clots in particular are elevated, possibly due to the inflammation and damage done to the blood vessel lining in our bodies as a result of infection or reinfection. Now, uh, similar findings, unfortunately, have also been documented in children too. Now, those with previous COVID-19, rates of blood clots, myocarditis or inflammation of the heart muscle, kidney disease, and diabetes were higher than those children without prior COVID-19. And while risk appears to be present regardless of the severity of acute infection, the risk of post-COVID-19 conditions is greatest among those with more severe acute COVID-19, those with underlying conditions, and those without prior vaccination. In some studies, reinfections appears to increase the risk of post-COVID-19 conditions as well. Now, furthermore, we know from our experience throughout the pandemic that Black and Hispanic communities have experienced disproportionately higher risk of acute infection and greater risk of severe disease than white communities. And as such, it is likely that these racial and ethnic disparities will also be seen in those with long COVID or post-COVID-19 conditions. Now, um, admittedly, there is still a lot for us to learn about the longer term of effects of infection, including post-COVID-19 conditions and long COVID. In the meantime, the layered approaches we take to protect ourselves from acute infection are likely also to be beneficial in lowering our risk of long COVID or post-COVID-19 conditions. Now, speaking of steps that we can take to reduce the risk of COVID-19 complications, vaccination remain an important part of that conversation. And in my opinion, COVID-19 vaccinations are some of the greatest scientific feats achieved during the pandemic. Both safe and effective, these vaccines have really altered the course of the pandemic by reducing the severity of disease in our communities and allowing our communities to return to the activities that they enjoyed prior to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The current vaccine continues to have good protection against the current circulating variants. 
Now, here locally, our lower back, our lower volume of hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19 are likely in part due to our success early on in maintaining high rates of primary vaccine series completion. This is amplified by those who have taken steps to stay up to date with the recommended vaccinations, including the updated bivalent booster available since September of 2022. Now, as a reminder, the updated bivalent vaccine is designed to protect against the Omicron variants that are currently circulating in our community, as well as the original variant of the virus. It provides added protection against severe disease and is available for individuals aged six months and older. It's particularly important for those who are at highest risk of severe illness from COVID-19, those aged 65 years and older, people who are immunocompromised or have other underlying medical conditions, but it provides important protection for everyone, even if you're low risk. Now remember that vaccination protects you as well as the people around you. So if you care for or live with people who may be at risk for severe disease, the best way to protect yourself and them is to stay up to date with the recommended vaccinations. It is also important to remember that our youngest age groups, those aged less than six months are not eligible for the vaccines. That is why it is important that pregnant people and people who come in contact with the youngest age group stay up to date with the recommended vaccinations. Now, vaccination education and outreach has been a core objective of our team and improving access by addressing healthcare disparities has been critical to our success to this point. We continue to operate our free in-home vaccination service for folks who are homebound and their caretakers. We also continue to work with community par partners to host free pop-up vaccination clinics in community settings, bringing vaccinations to people in settings they know and trust. I also want to put a plug in for a public health um, Auburn uh, Mall vaccine clinic. The hours are on our website. All this being said, we can continue to reduce the risk of severe disease in our communities by increasing the rates of people who are updated with the bivalent booster. Now, some statistics on that. So, so far, 68% of our King County residents aged 65 years and older have received their updated booster, but younger age groups have much lower rates of completion. We're also seeing some disparities by race and ethnicity. So even if you've received previous boosters prior to September 2022 or already had COVID-19, it is so important that you receive this updated booster. Now, for those who have already received the updated Biden booster since September 2022, you are considered up to date right now. So um, also, if you're looking for more information about vaccination boosters, including where you can get free vaccination, please check out our, web our website. So um, along these lines, I'd like to um, address one area of um, a topic of um, a lot of question and concern, um, and particularly around the recent overlapping changes, including the federal government's announcement to not renew the COVID-19 emergency declaration. So I want to spend a few moments talking about this topic. Uh, throughout most of the COVID-19 pandemic, we in public health have been able to provide a number of services from free PCR test sites to vaccination to strike teams to visit high risk areas. And this was in large part due to the emergency funding provided by the federal government. Now, since that time, much of the funding from the federal government has not been renewed, and this has had a direct impact on our scope of activities. And in many areas, we've had to scale back on our services. And we continue to work, of course, to secure additional funding for key COVID-19 related services. But public health in general continues to be underfunded and we're working hard to continue our commitments and efforts to protecting the community from COVID-19 as well as other communicable diseases. Now the federal government continues to maintain a stock of purchased COVID-19 vaccinations, tests and antivirals. This will remain free even if you don't have insurance for as long as the federal government supply lasts. We anticipate this may be likely through the end of the summer. Now, after that, COVID-19 vaccines will shift to the private market or undergo a process commonly known as commercialization. Uh, this means that getting a COVID-19 vaccine will likely be similar to the process folks are familiar with when getting a flu shot or other routine vaccines. Children are the exception, fortunately, for whom COVID-19 vaccines will remain free of charge regardless of insurance. Uh, recently, the federal government had made an announcement that they will allow the federal COVID-19 emergency declaration to expire in May of 2023, which is an administrative change and not a declaration that the COVID-19 pandemic is over. I want to make that um, uh, extra clear. Um, now, among a number of changes, the sunsetting of the emergency declaration will most likely be felt in coverage of COVID-19 vaccinations, tests, and treatments. Now, as I mentioned previously, the federal government continues to maintain a stockpile of purchase COVID-19 countermeasures, which will ensure that most of these resources will remain free until supplies run out. And when stocks run out, we may see the following changes. 
for COVID-19 vaccinations, children will continue to be able to access them for free through the federal vaccine programs as previously mentioned. For adults, the process will be similar to other routine vaccines. The biggest area of concern will be ensuring access to COVID-19 vaccines for adults who are un- or underinsured. For COVID-19 antivirals, people will likely have out-of-pocket charges or cost sharing for COVID-19 treatments. Like other medications, these costs will be dependent on the type of insurance coverage. Now for COVID-19 PCR tests, like those ordered by your doctor, these costs will be dealt with by insurances, likely similar to other diagnostic tests with out-of-pocket charges varying by insurance type. Uh, provisions to require insurances to cover at-home at antigen tests are likely to end as well as unfortunately. Now, over the coming year, as thousands come up for Medicaid renewal every month, that could also lead to a significant rise in uninsured individuals and families. And public health and its partners are leading efforts to reach people who may lose Medicaid cover insurance coverage and, and assist them in finding other coverage options. Now, while uh, these are some of the more direct effects of the end of the federal declaration, I do also worry about the indirect effects of these announcements where individuals and businesses might take this to mean that it is okay to let go of all those important lessons that we've learned during the pandemic that keep us safe from COVID-19. Now with severe disease, including hospitalizations and death trending downward for most people, I mentioned, as I mentioned previously, we're at a very different point in the pandemic today than before. Now, while many people have made the decision to take up activities that they once enjoyed before the pandemic, it is important to remember it's a combination of vaccine immunity, ongoing layer of protection, and natural immunity that has made this possible. And I also want to emphasize that the pandemic is not over and that the integration of lessons learned into our daily uh, routine is how we learn to live with COVID-19. Now, the risk of severe disease remains very real for many in our community, particularly those who have risk factors for severe disease, and not to mention the ongoing risk of long COVID and post-COVID-19 conditions. As I mentioned, one of my biggest concerns about the announcements to end the federal emergency declaration has been that people would take this to mean that COVID-19 pandemic is over or that COVID-19 is no longer an issue. Now, we've learned a lot through the pandemic, particularly about the layered steps that uh, work to protect us and our loved ones from infections, severe disease, as well as long-term complications of COVID-19. And we must carry these important lessons forward to provide protections for ourselves and for our loved ones as we learn to live with the ongoing circulation of the virus. We continue to recommend staying up to date with the recommended COVID-19 vaccinations, including uh, getting the updated by the booster. This will provide an important foundational protection against severe disease. Now, as you're considering your own risks and activities you're looking to engage in, here are the other important lessons uh, to remember. Now, with regards to masking, wearing a high quality, well-fitting mask like an N95 or KN95 in indoor public settings remains an effective tool uh, to reduce your risk of catching and spreading COVID-19. Remember, this reduces your contact with respiratory droplets from other people. It also reduces other people's contact with your respiratory droplets. And well-fitting masks are critical since you want to ensure that no aerosolized tiny particles get in through those open spaces. Um, I would particularly encourage masking in indoor public settings for folks who are at high risk. And this includes people who are aged 65 years and older, people of any age who have high risk conditions, and of course, those of us who spend time with these folks. Now, last week, Washington Department of Health announced that they would be lifting masking requirements in healthcare and other settings on April 3rd. Um, I wanna make sure that people understand that it is important to note that masking in these settings are still required until that time. And even after this requirement is lifted, the Washington Department of Health continues to recommend masks for patients, providers, and visitors in healthcare settings. After April 3rd, healthcare systems may choose to still require masks in their workplaces. Based on the current status of COVID-19 and the effectiveness of masks at preventing uh, spread of infection, we at Public Health Seattle King County agree with this recommendation to continue masking in healthcare settings. Well, what about testing? Well, testing also remains an important part of this layered approach to COVID-19 prevention and mitigation of severe disease. Now, if you have COVID-19 symptoms, even if mild, or if you've been exposed to someone who has COVID, isolate yourself right away and test for COVID. Isolation is critical so you can minimize your transmission to other people, particularly those at high risk for severe disease. Testing is important so that you can quickly begin treatment if your healthcare provider recommends it, and so that you can notify others who may have to, who may have been exposed so that they can also take the appropriate steps to keep themselves safe. 
Now, many PCR test sites have closed in recent months, and we anticipate that more will close this year as both funding and demand decreases. It is likely, however, that these tests will continue to be offered through your doctor's office. Now, while a little less sensitive, at-home rapid antigen tests are a great alternative to PCR tests. And if you're concerned that you might have COVID-19 because you were exposed or have COVID-19 symptoms and your initial at-home test was negative, then we would recommend isolating yourself and conducting at, uh, another at-home test 24 to 48 hours later through a process called serial testing. And again, five days or more after your symptoms began. Now, currently free COVID-19 home tests or antigen tests are available each month from Washington State's SayYesCovidHomeTest.org. Uh, and we also continue to distribute free rapid tests to our community centers, libraries, direct service organizations that then distribute to their community. Now, if you prefer a PCR test, check with your healthcare provider or find a list of free and uh, sliding scale PCR test sites on our webpage. Now, along with all these other layer of protections, it's also important to acknowledge the importance of ventilation and filtration. Now, as people go back to work in offices, enjoy activities in indoor spaces, and welcome people back into their homes, one critical area to focus on is improving indoor air quality through ventilation, filtration, and UV technology where appropriate. Now, the reason for this is that COVID-19 viral particles spread more readily between people indoors and outdoors, especially with fewer people choosing to mask in these settings, it's more critical than ever that we focus on these changes moving forward. Now, the principle behind this is, of course, decreasing the viral particle concentrations that float around in the air. And I actually like how CDC describes this on their website, that even a light wind uh, can rapidly reduce concentration of the virus. Now, as the weather gets warmer and where it is safe, opening a window along with the use of fans can help reduce the concentration of viral particles in a room. And we talked about some of these things before, but other options include, of course, the Rosenthal box, which is a do-it-yourself air purifier that you can use at home that's low cost. You can find more information on our websites and our links. And operating under these, uh, the same objective of reducing concentration of viral particles, Businesses, offices, and other public indoor spaces can also take steps to improve air quality through introduction of outdoor air, adjusting HVAC systems, improving air filtration, ensuring exhaust fans like those in the restrooms are functional, use of portable HEPA fan and filtration systems, and the use of ultraviolet germicidal radiation or UV technology to supplement these other steps. Now, these combined efforts can in turn reduce the risk of viral particles getting inhaled and causing infection. Now, um, I want to point out that there are several other resources about this from CDC and as well as through our, our previous Public Health Insider blog. And um, as for prepared remarks, uh, thank you for joining me uh, through that uh, and for your ongoing efforts to remind our community of the important lessons learned during the pandemic. Um, I'll turn it over for questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow. And for the um, extensive and really up-to-date information, and we'll be able to post your comments as well on our blog at publichealthinsider.com in the upcoming couple of days, so folks can go back and um, review some of the really important content that Dr. Chow was able to share today, so thank you. We'll move ahead with asking some questions from media. And um, we'll get going here with Joseph Sullivan. And just as a reminder for media, if you can let us know your outlet, that always helps us. So Joseph, you can go ahead. Hi, Joe Sullivan from uh, Crosscut here. Uh, Dr. Chow, as we sort of step in here on kind of the third anniversary, the beginning of COVID, um, and given what happened all through it, you know, the polarization and sort of the fatigue of, of dealing with the virus, and now uh, the last of the restrictions more or less being um, lifted. What's your sense of how what things will look like with the pandemic going forward? And, and are you optimistic that we're going to learn some of these lessons uh, for the long term and, and farther down the road? Yeah, excellent. Well, first off, thank you for that really important question. And I think that that question is packed with a lot of important points that is worth highlighting again. I think that having been in public health from the very beginning, from that moment where we first realized that COVID-19 was here in our communities, here in the US, um, and to where we are now, we've learned a lot of, again, important lessons about the way the viruses behave, um, how it can sometimes throw us curveballs, uh, and, uh, and but at the same time, we've been equipped with a lot more knowledge and a lot more tools than we've ever been at other previous times during the pandemic. 
And I think this is an important uh, area to, again, reiterate that a layered approach and carrying over these lessons learned is going to be really critical to how we address our own risk uh, when we engage in activities that we've previously um, you know, been doing uh, prior to the pandemic. And so again, it's that layered approach, right? Um, so now with all this knowledge about how to protect ourselves, we know that vaccination is gonna re, um, uh, remain a core piece of that protection. So staying up to date, staying up to date with what is recommended, including this updated by the booster is gonna be really critical, uh, as well as masking. Um, you know, Honestly, before the pandemic, masking wasn't really much on my mind, but certainly after the pandemic, this is something that uh, myself, my young family, we're gonna be incorporating in all the activities that we do. So yes, I think I am hopeful that the, uh, the community will take these principles uh, learn carrying forward, but it's also important that we demonstrate this and uh, reiterate it uh, for the community to remind them that even though, um, you know, the general mentality has moved towards this endemic state, COVID-19 is still very much in our lives, in our communities, and we need to continue to take these precautions to reduce all the, uh, to reduce the risk as much as we can. Thank you, Dr. Chow. We'll take a question from Kate Walters. You can go ahead, Kate. Hi, Dr. Chow. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I apologize about my voice. I've got laryngitis at the moment, so I'm sorry about that. Um, wanted to just check in around the um, this shift in how people can access vaccines as this federal emergency ends uh, and the stockpile at some point will run out. Um, we've already seen a disproportionate burden of disease in communities of color. We know there are disparities in vaccination in our communities of color. Is public health looking at any way to try to prevent those disparities from widening when we shift to this new form of, of vaccine access? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, that is a core objective for public health here. Uh, public Health Seattle King County is to continue to address those concerns around disparities. And I think one of the things that we've learned during the pandemic is, is that using this kind of mixed method, working with community partners is uh, so important in uh, one, getting the message out and two, identifying the areas where there are resource deserts. And we know that it's not just here in King County, but other uh, areas in the nation too, where health departments are really working hard with, unfortunately, the limited funding that we've been equipped with to be able to uh, carry those activities forward. And certainly it's something that's on my mind. And I know that there are a lot of changes that are forthcoming that you know we're not sure the full impact of. But uh, certainly as we look into the fall, we're going to try to stand up as many of those activities as possible to ensure that there's uh, equitable distrib uh, distribution of this vaccine and access remains a critical focus of ours. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow. And um, we have a question in our Q&A from a reporter, Mayor Gruel from Worth a Shot. And uh, just to read her question to you, she uh, asked that, yeah, wanted you to know, thank you, Dr. Chow, for a really wonderful and comprehensive update. My questions are, and there are two questions here. One, do you anticipate new variants in the fall? And also, will we need boosters yearly? Uh, excellent, excellent questions. Uh, you're thinking very much uh, like an epidemiologist and uh, someone who's worked in public health. So um, let me um, uh, tackle uh, both these questions uh, together. So uh, first off, I, I just want to say we're always concerned about variants. Um, again, why do we why are we concerned about variants? Because at previous times during the pandemic, it was variants that were responsible for the surges that we saw in the previous peaks. And so it's important that we track what those are, what's currently circulating. So, um, you know, recently we, uh, there was a lot of attention on XBB15, which had gained a lot of national attention because of certain mutations that it had and the possibility of increased severity of disease. Now, uh, fortunately, as XBB15 had become more common in our communities, including here in King County, we had not actually seen the increases in severe disease that we were previously concerned about. Um, and furthermore, the current vaccines continue to provide very good protection against severe disease. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we know that uh, genomic sequencing or essentially viral fingerprinting uh, is an a important public health tool for us to be able to keep track of the constant changing milieu of viruses out there. 
Um, however, our ability to detect, to detect these new variants also depends on several important factors moving forward. Uh, this includes uh, whether people choose to get tested, which is where a lot of these samples come from, and whether broad funding is available to support genomic sequencing. Now, I expect both of these to change moving forward um, in varying degrees, and, um, but we acknowledge that genomic sequencing has been uh, a really important piece a really important tool for public health work. And I know that public health organizations will continue to explore ways to maintain a certain degree of sequencing um, moving forward so that we can understand what is circulating in our communities. So, um, you know, new variants are constantly out there um, in terms of variants of concern. Uh, sure, it's very possible. So long as COVID-19 is circulating in our communities, uh, new variants are certainly uh, possible. So whatever we can do to lessen that burden by, you know, uh, again, uh, implementing all those, uh, the layered guidance that I had uh, outlined previously is going to be really critical and in, in, including staying up to date with the recommended vaccinations. Now, with regards to the vaccines, um, so um, there's a couple of things I want to point out about this. Um, so first off, um, you know, the general rule of thumb is, is that if you've received your last booster before September 2022, you're probably due for a new booster. Uh, the CDC recommends one updated booster for everyone aged five years and older who completed their primary series and for children aged six months to four years who completed the Moderna primary series. Now, there's currently no booster recommendation for children aged six months to four years who got the Pfizer COVID-19 primary vac uh, vaccine primary series. Um, and uh, once you receive that new booster, you're considered up to date and there are no additional recommendations at this time. Although the CDC and the FDA continue to evaluate the available scientific evidence for possible updated guidance for high risk groups. Now, that being said, your question is pertaining to an annual booster recommendation. It's a very good question. This is something that we're all looking, uh, looking towards for especially for the fall. Uh, and that is a COVID-19 um, you know, working group recently for the CDC's advisory committee on immunization practices has actually supported an annual booster campaign. So I actually would expect there to be new boosters available ahead of what we would consider to be that typical respiratory viral season extending from September or probably until spring. Um, and uh, this will allow an opportunity for us to update the vaccine um, based on the predominant circulating variants of COVID-19 and also to give our immune systems that extra boost to protect against, uh, uh, you know, again, against uh, severe disease such as hospitalizations, death, uh, long COVID, post-COVID-19 conditions, and allow us to have the extra layer of protection as we engage in those activities that we enjoy doing. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have a question from um, one of our community members watching um, who is asking about how the flu season has compared with uh, COVID at this point and what you can tell us about what's happening with flu. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for touching on this topic. Um, actually, flu is uh, uh, of great interest to me, um, especially because that's something I was studying prior to, uh, you know, my COVID-19 work. Um, so uh, it's, uh, but I will say up front that it's a little bit hard to compare the two. Uh, first off, so uh, influenza season this past year was a little bit different than what we anticipated. It came a little bit earlier. It came on the heels of an RSV surge and then quickly died down again, likely because of all the uh, work that we did as a community to help mitigate respiratory viral infections. Um, and uh, it's, uh, but the flu also, we know, kind of surges usually during this time. Now, what we don't know about COVID-19 is whether, um, as it uh, continues to circulate in our communities, whether it's going to follow that similar pattern. Now, flu and COVID-19, you know, are different viruses, so we expect them to behave differently, all, even though they produce similar symptoms. Um, and so um, I think there's a, still a lot for us to learn about what that uh, seasonal pattern might be uh, for COVID-19, if there is even if there is even a seasonal pattern for COVID-19. Uh, right now, we're still seeing ups and downs fluctuations uh, over time. So I, I don't think it's hit its baseline yet. Great. Thank you so much. And, um, and we can follow up as well. There was a question about uh, flu involved deaths compared to COVID involved us and um, anything you want to add about uh, our surveillance or tracking around flu deaths per se? Oh, I, I, just to say that, you know, on our website, we do have those numbers. So the, uh, those that's probably the most accurate, um, you know, count uh, for with regards to flu deaths. 
But uh, that's, an, again, one of the important measures that we uh, take into account when we're trying to assess just community burden, um, not just for flu, but for COVID-19 as well. Uh, and so um, those are, again, uh, things to pay attention to kind of moving forward. But if you have specific questions, I'm happy to address those as well. Great, thank you. And we put, um, we'll put some of the data on flu stats up on mm -hmm. the website as well, or in the chat as well. Yep. Um, great. We have a follow-up question from Kate Walter, so you can go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for indulging me for a second question. Um, sure. you, you've highlighted the um, the fact that COVID remains present despite sort of the phase that we're in um, and the need to continue those precautions that we've learned over the past few years. Can you talk a little bit about what's at yeah. stake if folks don't do that, if people decide, you know, we're just going to go back to living like it's 2019 as opposed to continuing these lessons learned over the past couple of years. What might that look like for us if, if that's the way that the community responds? Yeah, great. Excellent question. So just to rephrase that. So um, basically, let's say we, we forget that COVID even existed and uh, COVID continues to circulate and everyone throws caution into the wind. Well, I'd be very concerned uh, about a number of different things is that, you know, COVID uh, circulation is going to increase, uh, severity of disease is going to increase because people are no longer going to choose to get vaccinated. And that combination is probably going to allow for the virus to have a larger kind of genetic milieu to mutate uh, and transmit more efficiently. And so those combination of uh, factors, I think is important for all of us to keep in mind that uh, these lessons learned that we uh, took from the pandemic is going to be really critical for us to kind of carry forward. You know, once upon a time, we learned, uh, you know, in, during the pandemic, we actually learned that uh, masking is really, really critical to reducing uh, infections related to COVID-19, actually other respiratory viruses as well. And that's something, again, that I'm planning on uh, carrying over into my daily activities. Um, just as much as once upon a time, people learned that hand hygiene or seatbelts were going to be important in reducing their, you know, risk of uh, other adverse outcomes in various scenarios. So that same principle about masking, I'm going to be carrying forward into my activities so that I can reduce uh, my risk of severe disease uh, for myself as well as my family. Thank you, Dr. Chow. And we have a question about masks. Um, there was a review known as the Cochrane Review that came out that um, had some information about masks and effectiveness of masks. And uh, many in the public health community had concerns about that review and some of the conclusions that were drawn by others out um, in the community and wanted to know if you could make a, you know, tell us what your thoughts are about that review um, and just clarify for folks what you know. Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks uh, for that opportunity. Uh, excellent question. Um, I know there's a lot of confusion generated by this, so it's a good opportunity to, to provide our thoughts. Uh, so what this question refers to is there is a review of older studies on mask use and hand washing to prevent infection from respiratory uh, viruses, including influenza. Uh, it's actually uh, a review that's not specific to COVID-19, uh, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, a lot of people in the public health community have actually identified uh, many limitations of that review. Um, particularly around the quality of studies that were included and the relevance of the included studies for like COVID-19. In fact, most of the studies reference occurred uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, and some of those studies had significant limitations, such as the people who they were studying for mass effectiveness weren't in fact always using masks. Um, and so, or, or even wearing them properly. So I think that's a huge challenge and a limitation that uh, I think needs to be addressed. And part of this is that, you know, there's so much attention on the study that I worry that this will create um, a lot of confusion. So uh, let me um, uh, take a moment to clarify, you know, what we know about high quality, well-fitting masks has not changed because of that review. In fact, COVID-19 spreads through respiratory droplets, including aerosolized tiny little particles that stay suspended in the air. And masks in general, uh, including cloth and surgical masks, will reduce the spread of these larger droplets. But it's the high quality, well-fitting masks that will maximize the risk reduction of infection from all the different sized particles that COVID-19 uses to spread. And that's why we continue to highlight the importance of that as a layered um, protection um, you know, as we go about our daily activities. Thank you so much. Um, and before I turn it over to you for some final comments, um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about post-COVID conditions. And you spoke sure. a, a lot about that. 
Um, for folks in the community who may be concerned, what are some of our recommendations at this point for folks who may be concerned about post-COVID conditions? Are there treatment options? Where do people go for um, support and care and to learn the latest about uh, the signs coming in? As we know, there's still a lot to learn in this area. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that uh, question again. Uh, so post-COVID-19 conditions um, actually goes by many names. Uh, and to provide some clarification, I used two terms during this presentation. One, post-COVID-19 conditions, which I think is a term more commonly used in the scientific and medical community. And we also have long COVID, which is maybe more commonly used in the general community. Now, long COVID is a term that actually uh, was coined by patients who had um, uh, uh, who had these persisting symptoms after they have recovered early on during the pandemic, before the medical community fully understood what was happening to them. And so um, these two terms continue to be used. Um, I appreciate um, that there is this concern around it because it certainly is something that I'm paying a lot of attention to, particularly when I try to articulate to people the importance of layer protection. It's not just for acute infection, but it's for also that time period afterwards when your body is still trying to recover and where you're at risk for all these other types of symptoms that are incredibly debilitating and impact quality of life. Um, and so there are a lot more resources now um, than before. I would say that in terms of first resources, um, you know, online, uh, the CDC website actually provides a very good summary on what post-COVID-19 conditions are and where our current understanding is. I think the other thing, the other place is that if you're concerned that you may have symptoms related to our prior acute, um, you know, uh, COVID-19, uh, this is a perfect opportunity to have that discussion with your, um, your healthcare provider, uh, and they can help you sort out uh, to see if there are any additional tests that might be helpful uh, to be able to sort out, uh, you know, what is going to be best for you. Now, um, you know, people who have post-COVID-19 conditions and long COVID have a lot of different symptoms, a lot of different conditions, quite heterogeneous. So there's not going to be one-size-fits-all workup, one-size-fits-all treatment. And a lot of it is going to be addressing symptoms that are affecting the individual. So, um, you know, this is where uh, speaking with your healthcare provider is going to be really important. Fortunately, here in uh, Washington, specifically here in King County, we have a lot of experts, a lot of people who are really um, keen on better understanding what post-COVID-19 conditions are. And we're learning a lot more by the day. Um, but that being said, there's a lot more for us to learn. And I think that... Um, uh, the most important thing to kind of take away, certainly from this presentation, is that the best way to protect yourself against post-COVID-19 conditions is actually to protect yourself against infection. And this includes reinfection. So even if you've had previous infection and you were fortunate enough not to get post-COVID-19 conditions, um, you know, you still need to protect yourself against reinfection uh, and that risk still remains. And again, uh, I highlight one study that even suggests that, you know, there's actually a cumulative effect and cumulative risk that can occur. But again, there's still a lot for us to uh, learn about post-COVID-19 conditions. Um, there is also one other study, which we can also link uh, later, that I thought was of particular interest and was highlighted by New York Times earlier in the year. Uh, this was actually do it using immune profiling to look at uh, people who went on to develop these longer term symptoms after re they recovered from acute uh, infection. And what this study did well uh, relative some, to some of the other studies that are out there is that they had a control group. So they compare people who had acute SARS-CoV-2 infection or acute COVID-19 to those people who have never had it. And then they followed them over time. They drew blood and samples and analyzed it. And, you know, uh, and they looked at the risk factors associated with one group compared to the other. And um, uh, they, they noticed that there are uh, differences in the immune uh, makeup uh, of those people who have had uh, prior uh, COVID-19, and that this um, uh, may be uh, associated with the development of uh, post-COVID-19 conditions. So again, on that level of the immunological profiling, there's still a lot for us to learn, but there could be something there that's um, causing people to experience these symptoms thereafter. And again, I just wanna highlight that we do have a lot of great experts. In fact, I think many of you may have heard from Dr. Jana Friedley earlier last year in another one of these uh, COVID-19 uh, updates uh, where she 
she talked about her role as uh, the director for the University of Washington uh, 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 post-COVID-19 condition uh, center uh, that has really helped a lot of people, particularly those with the most complex post-COVID-19 conditions. Uh, and uh, she and many others are kind of spearheading that um, uh, the expertise uh, in uh, the growing expertise in that area. Thank you so much, Dr. Chow. And I think um, we will just turn it back over to you for any final thoughts or words today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I actually, yeah, I would like to share some summarizing points. Now, I didn't mention this in detail at the beginning of the presentation, but I was actually here um, at Public Health Seattle King County, working for CDC at the time when the first large US outbreak of COVID-19 occurred. And that was a stressful time. Uh, I know you all remember it well. Um, you know, as we were learning about the first report of COVID-19 death, uh, can be spread and general implications for how we move forward uh, as a society. And you know, by the time I transitioned back into my work as a physician here in Seattle, um, I was able to actually witness the rollout of the vaccine big turning point for the pandemic. That's why I think the vaccine remains so critical to all of us in protecting ourselves against um, you know, uh, COVID-19 complications. Um, and the community really came together at that critical point to support a broad vaccination uh, effort centered on equity. And then on top of that, promoted a consistent message of layered protection and continued precautions while we uh, better understood which way the pandemic was headed. And these were the reasons why I chose to come to work here in Seattle is because people understood that when we talk about risk, it's not just about individual risk, but you make considerations keeping the larger community in mind. And um, you know we've come a long way since those early days of the pandemic and uh, where we are now, we have more tools and like I mentioned, the knowledge to be able to reduce our own risk of severe disease. And given that COVID-19 is likely to continue to circulate in our communities, the risks associated with infection and reinfection will be present, whether that be for severe disease or post-COVID-19 conditions. So the more we allow COVID-19 to circulate, as a previous question um, you know, alluded to, the greater that risk will be for individuals and us as a community. Now, at the same time, uh, we know that uh, you know, which situations and activities are at higher risk for infection. We also know that layered approaches work by reducing but not completely eliminating risk. So we have to be very thoughtful about the decisions uh, and the context of our surroundings, the people around us, the current burden of COVID-19 in the community. We also have to acknowledge that while severe disease is much lower now for most people than during other parts of the pandemic, severe disease remains high among those with risk factors, such as older folks and those with underlying conditions. And the choices that we make to reduce our risks uh, can also help reduce the burden for others in the community. Now, the lessons learned around layer protections are so important. I'm gonna reiterate them again. Um, uh, staying up to date with the recommended COVID-19 vaccination is the best way to protect us from severe COVID-19, such as having to go to a hospital or from dying. Um, it may also lessen your risk for post-COVID-19 conditions. Now, the added protection from the updated bivalent booster will further reduce the chances of these uh, severe outcomes. Uh, when a new booster dose is available in the fall, I know that my young family and I will be looking to stay up to date with the most recent recommendation because we will take every opportunity to reduce our risks uh, through safe and effective vaccination ahead of any surges or increases in disease burden. And we'll also provide that extra layer of protection, particularly when we're considering planning activities and you know, that we really enjoy doing. Now, combining vaccination with other steps will further reduce risks, and this includes, again, while wearing a well-fitting, high-quality mask when indoors to prevent viral particles from getting inhaled, testing early to ensure that you have access to COVID-19 antiviral treatment if you are eligible, and to inform others who may have been exposed, isolating when you are ill uh, so you prevent spread to other people, including those who may be at high risk for severe disease, as well as improving indoor ventilation, especially as we increase our activities in these indoor spaces. So I would say that as you plan out your activities for the coming months, you know, be sure to keep these points in mind. The consideration and integration of these combined measures in our routine activities will be important for all of us to carry forward as we enter this next phase of the pandemic. Now with that, um, thank you all so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for all the insightful questions and your uh, ongoing support of our uh, public health messaging.